Good morning, church. I didn't have the power on. That makes all the difference in the world, amen? All right. Well, welcome to um, the Lakeland Seventh-day Adventist Church, whether you are in person this morning or viewing us online. We're glad that you're here with us. And <clears throat> we do have people in both locations. I wanted to um, make mention of a few items of announcement. One order of business for the church, and we'll do that last. We have two readings for you today. Um, adult Sabbath school class is this afternoon at 2 p.m. like we have every week. I uh, have not been announcing those every week, but every so often I want to make sure I remind you. Um, if you're at home or wherever you are, you can use your cell phone. Go on to our Facebook page. Just open up Facebook. Go to Lakeland, um, 7th Avenue Church, and you'll find our homepage. Scroll down a little bit, and at 2 o'clock, it will go live with our Sabbath school lesson by uh, Toya. And then <clears throat> from 4 to 6 p.m., either in person or via Zoom, we will be having our um, three Sabbaths out of the month. We have a Pathfinder meeting, and we have about 20 Pathfinders, and so they will be meeting again today as well. And then I want to remind you about our Easter drama. Uh, Flo and Don and I were out scouting the grounds. We're going to be doing it in the front yard first Sabbath in April, and we are considering doing it a little bit earlier. Now, today is beautiful out there, but you can never know um, how quickly it's going to get hot. And now we're moving towards summer. So we may move the time up to 10 or even 9. Uh, we'll let you know for sure next week. But just, you know, Sabbath should be an easily flexible day as long as you know we can advance. Um, we may meet earlier just so we can beat the heat and also the sun because we're going to be doing some video out there. So we're going to be testing that out this next week with all of our um, sound system and electronics and so on. But April 3rd, Sabbath morning, our Easter drama. And it will be with masks, uh, but it will be on the lawn and sit in your family units, and we should have plenty of space. Uh, final note is for tithes and offerings. And uh, for those of you who have been giving, Thank you so much for your continued support. Florida Conference has been doing well um, throughout the state. Um, I don't know if people have not been hurt like in some other places that are Adventist because some of our industries, tourism and stuff has been hit hard here. Um, or if people have uh, been able, who have been able to have reached in a little deeper, but currently uh, we're doing well. Our local church is doing well. Our conference is doing well. Thank you very much if you're a regular supporter. And if you don't know, you don't have to bring in a tithe envelope and drop it in the, um, in the box in the foyer. You can go online, AdventistGiving.org. You can select the church of your choice and give there. By the way, I found out uh, by putting in the word Lakeland, I just went through it just to experience it. If you are first time to the site, uh, you'll get five other Lakeland Seventh-day Adventist churches besides our own. So uh, make sure to look carefully at the word. There's Spanish churches. There's an Eden Lakeland church. There's even a Lakeland, Wisconsin church. So you just want to pick the Lakeland church that is located at 1435 Gilmore Avenue. That'll be the right one. <laughs> All right. Um, and, and you can go to our own homepage, our own website, um, and click on that, and that doesn't have that problem. All right, thank you very much. Um, Elder Tom's going to bring one more announcement, then I've got the two readings, and then we'll go on with the service. I started rereading the Bible. Um, um, is that better? Um, I started rereading the Bible, uh, try to read every day, and uh, in the books of Moses, and you remember the Israelites had manna every day, and on Friday they got a double portion of manna bread from heaven. Well, the food pantry received the Friday portion this week. We got more bread than we can possibly get rid of. 
if you any, anybody wants bread, I've got 80 loaves I've got to get rid of. There's 20 people here. So uh, I hope you're hungry for bread. Uh, come over to the food pantry after the church service and we'll give you bread. We've just extended our policy a week ago. I don't think I let Tom know. You can actually pray without your mask on. So from the uh, platform. We've just uh, expanded permissions up here from the pew and on campus. We all will wear our masks, but from up here, our singers, people praying and uh, preaching will be able to take their masks off because we've allowed for distancing and for cross uh, ventilation to uh, provide your protection. <clears throat> just in case. Anyway, first reading is for Abigail Blanchard, who is transferring her membership from here, the Lakeland Seventh-day Adventist Church to the Concord Seventh-day Adventist Church in New Hampshire. This is also a second reading. We had the first reading up on the screen a couple weeks um, for Angela Godwin to be transferred from here to the Lake Nelson Seventh-day Adventist Church in New Jersey. So today we need to do a vote from the church present to approve the transfer of Angela uh, Godwin to the Lake Nelson Seventh-day Adventist Church in New Jersey. Those approving, raise your hand. Thank you. Hands down. Those who disapprove, who want to vote against that for some reason, hands, no hands. All right. That's unanimous. Um, we'll pass that along to um, our clerk and get that in process. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll have Elder Tom come forward for, uh, maybe you could do the Opening prayer and the devo and the invocational prayer all together, because I don't think I've done that yet. Yet, shall we kneel in so far as possible? <coughs> Dear Lord, we come to you today to thank you for the many blessings that you give to us. Thank you for a cool day today. Um, we know that. Summer is coming. Spring is today, and, and from now on, we're going to have heat. And we thank you for a nice, cool day with the wind, for the rain we had uh, a little bit uh, Thursday night. Thank you for that. Thank you for each person that's here today. Just ask you to be with our service, be with each of our uh, people here in the church, be with the pastor as he breaks the bread of life to us today. <laughs> Speak through him. Uh, bring uh, the message that you want him to preach to us today to encourage us in a uh, society today that there is so much discouragement. Just uh, help him uh, present a message that's positive that we can take and, and uh, think about through the week as we think of you. Just ask you to be with um, uh, all of our members. I know Dennis has a grandson that's uh, that's sick. Lou is Lou uh, Cruz is uh, just got out of the hospital uh, yesterday and he's not uh, doing well. We've got a great granddaughter that's very sick right now. And, uh, and I know that uh, we've asked for prayer for our nation. Uh, our nation is um, divided such as we haven't seen for many, many years. Just uh, we ask you as we pray and as we humble ourselves that you will hear us from heaven and heal our land and um, be with uh, those that serve uh, in first responders. Uh, just there's so much uh, unrest there, uh, getting in trouble as they go to help people. So just uh, relieve that situation as well and just bring us each one closer to you. We can't help but believe that the, th that the time of your coming is very close. Help us be ready to meet you in the clouds of glory and look up and say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. We pray these favors in your name. Amen. <clears throat> you 
You know, uh, this song says there's a miracle in the making. And if we ever needed a miracle for our world, for our nation, it's now. Not so much for COVID, the physical, physical sickness, but the, phys the spiritual sickness that we're enduring today. And these, the last days, we are suffering so much spiritually. The Bible says in the last days, there'd be a famine for the word of God. We can't let that happen. We have to spread the word. And you know, it begins in our family, in our own family, mama, daddy, grandma, grandpa. Our families need to pray like we've never prayed before. And we as parents and grandparents need to spread the word to our children and grandchildren and get it so engraved into their hearts and their minds that the world can't touch them. As a family, we need to pray and build a hedge of blood from Jesus and a hedge of protection around our families and not allow the enemy of this world, this country, this city, this state to get into our families because God instituted the home and the family before he instituted even the church. So as I sing this song, think of the miracle that you need in your life and think of all the other people that need miracles in their homes and in their hearts and in their lives. Thank you. was great, but she knew she had to reach it, for he was her last hope of ever being here. So she pressed until she touched his garment and right then and there a miracle was fulfilled oh have you prayed and prayed but still you find And you feel so all alone. Don't lose hope for the God you serve won't fail you. There's a miracle for you, so keep hope. Thank you. 
Thank you, sister. Appreciate that very much. Last week, several people came up afterwards and thanked me for the message. Um, their perspective was it gave them hope and courage in times when uh, you know we sometimes go through self-condemnation, condemnation by others around us, to listen to the voices within us that are from God and that seek to remind us that we're made in His image. And that was the intent of, of the message. Um, there may be others who heard it different ways. It's always a challenge when you're up here because I only have control over the words I speak and my, the intentions of my heart, not the way it's heard and received by others. So I, I pray all the time, and I'm going to pray right now, that God will take uh, what I'm doing and as best possible control what I say and how I give it, but also control, guide how you hear it and how you receive it, because it is intended to be a blessing for the church. Last week, we focused on the individual. This week, I want to focus on the collective, um, the idea of, of what moves us to group up to include some people in and other people out, and what God can tell us about that that might help us. So in preparation for that, um, let us uh, bow before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> <clears throat> Father God, we were made in your image. We are called to be your people. We are diverse. We are unique. We are fallen, but we've been saved. And we've been called to be one people under one God. That's much easier said. Must much easier sung about than practiced. But today, Lord, I believe your word has something for us to help to help us have some success, some bit of experiencing the oneness that is possible through Christ Jesus. The oneness is possible as we recognize that you are the source of us all. Father God, may your spirit <clears throat> guide my thoughts and my words, may your spirit guide what is heard and implanted in the hearts, and may your spirit bear fruit in all of our lives, mine and those listening this morning, whether here in person or online, that we might look like your people, feel like your people to those that come into our midst. Not perfectly, I know, but that we might be seen and experience that we are in process, that you have control of our lives and are reshaping us and restoring us in your image is my prayer in Jesus name. Amen. This morning's message had to change one more time from the time that I gave it to Andre to the time that I could preach it here. And uh, so the message title is Focusing on, our forgive, Focusing on Our Forgotten Family Ties. Focusing on Our Forgotten Family Ties. I heard an interview recently in the last couple of weeks from National Public Radio. I don't know if anybody, does anybody else listen to NPR besides myself? That's my daily um, top of the hour, get the least of reports, and sometimes there's some special programming when I'm driving one place or another. 
And I caught this one interview with an author who had written a book about the discovery he made of a brother he didn't know he had. He located him um, through an internet service called Ancestry.com. And after he had located, uh, or after he had discovered he had this brother, then he began to search and locate his address and phone number and how he might contact him. And he began engaging in conversations over the miles. He in New York, his newfound brother in Texas. And eventually came the time for them to meet. And the brother from New York, I believe drove, maybe he flew, but he went all the way to Texas um, to spend some time with this brother he had found. And these brothers were quite different brothers. Uh, the one brother, for, for instance, was white and the other brother was black. They shared the same father, but they had different mothers. The mother of the uh, white brother was the wife of the man who was their father. The mother of the black brother was a slave of the man who was not their father, their grandfather. Uh, this is a couple of generations, excuse me. I knew I would make that. I said, Lord, help me not make that mistake, but it's a couple of generations difference. But they had met up in this one man who had birthed their fathers, who birthed them. And that, um, that was enough for these two men to desire not only to converse, to understand each other, to get to know each other, but to meet. And they spent the day together sharing pictures and stories, and then have continued on a relationship from that time. Even though they had not known each other before, even though they could have allowed real issues, real harm, real racial tensions to come between them, and they weren't all resolved, they're, they're, that wasn't that was tension free, but they overcame all those things because they shared a common bloodline. They shared back a ways a common father. And that was enough because they had a common father to bring them together and to look beyond their differences to their commonalities. I remember doing a genealogical tracing in, in school. Do you remember getting an assignment like that? I think most schools, or they used to all do that. No? Did anybody not? Anybody else do a genealogy in school as an assignment? Okay, thank you. Um, not everybody, I guess. I, I thought it was like standard. But I remember um, doing that. I remember my sister doing that when she went through. She really got into it. I just did the assignment. My sister went beyond, and uh, she wound up tracing our family line back to Germany and to Austria. I remember also my parents going to annual family reunions. Does anybody do that anymore? <laughs> we haven't done that in a long time. Now, we, we used to get together when we were up north with our immediate family for Christmas or for Thanksgiving. But to really have multi-generational, you know, everyone who's alive, who's in the blank last name clan, uh, to come together and travel across country and take time to do this, I have not been a part of since I was a kid. But at that time, everybody would come to this one picnic area and we had this pavilion we'd meet at every year and as a little kid I didn't know any of these people I'm like how long do we have to stay here mom and dad they appreciated it much more than me although over the passing years I got to know some of the cousins and the other kids that were similar to my age that I never would have met otherwise why did we do that because there was something in us that wanted us to connect or stay connected to people that we didn't really have friendships with in the sense that we didn't see them every day. We didn't even see them on a weekly basis like we do coming to church services. We saw each other on an annual basis once a year, but we were family. We had seen a connection that we valued, or we valued a connection that we had in our family line. The bloodline was reason enough to invest time in connecting and getting to know each other even a little bit each year. In times like we're living right now, 
when there is much division due to political ideology, racial differences, and religious convictions. I've felt impressed by God to share with you and to take it upon myself to consider another way of living than is popular, it seems, today in our divisive hotbed, as it were, that we seem to be living in. I sense the Lord, our God, trying to help His church to focus on our forgotten family ties. Forgotten family ties. If you believe, as I do, that the Bible is a trustworthy source of truth and knowledge, that God instructs us there to make our lives better here as well as prepare us for eternity with Him, then we need to admit that the one who is the deceiver and the liar, the oppressor of Christ, and the divider of humanity is Satan, not our ideologies, not our racial differences, even our religious convictions. It's what Satan does with those that divides. And it's what God allows us to focus on instead that will unite us, not compromising who we are, but uniting us in spite of our differences and uniquenesses. First Chronicles 128, if you have your Bibles or Bible devices, First Chronicles 128, New King James Version. The Bible says, The sons of Abraham were Isaac and Ishmael. Abraham is the father of all Jews that came through Isaac and Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. And Abraham is the father of all Muslims, the Islamic uh, religion that grew out of Ishmael's descendants and all those who might not actually be part of that uh, Muslim Islamic group, but they're part of that uh, bloodline. Out of those two sons came vast numbers of people that we look at today and relate to in religious terms, but they had a common source. Now, they believe and they practice very different things through their religions and what they identify with right now. But what if they identified with themselves prior to the distinctions of Judaism and Islam? What if they identified with themselves as Abrahamic? What difference would that make? They share common ancestry. Ultimately, they have a common father. Not only the father Abraham, but also God himself, who created all of us. Yes? Every one of us. So what of the non-Jews and the non-Muslims like me? Perhaps like you? How are we brought into this fellowship? Because I don't know that I could trace my lineage back to Abraham as a father uh, genetically, <clears throat> but the Bible says that God created the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, and that from them, their offspring was to fill the earth and populate it. So not only do we all share a common mother or father in Adam and Eve, but Galatians 3, verse 7, Galatians 3, verse 7 also says that those who are of faith are sons and daughters of Abraham, which is to attain a righteousness that is by faith, a common bloodline, which is the blood of Christ shed on the cross through our faith in him as Messiah, as Christ, as the Lord's sacrificial lamb. Titus 3, verses 9 and 10 reads as follows. Avoid foolish disputes. Avoid genealogies. Avoid contentions. Avoid strivings about the law. For they are all unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and the second admonition. Knowing such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. That's a powerful statement. 
in the last days, Paul is appealing um, to Titus, his friend, that we need to avoid those whose mission in the church, whose mission in our families, whose mission in society are to divide, 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 divide. We're to warn them that we're about uniting under God and Christ. We're not about dividing and causing divisions that glorify Satan, but about finding our commonality in Christ and God. Now that doesn't mean, I want to make sure you don't mishear me, that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter what we believe. It doesn't mean that we are not to recognize that we are different. Not at all. It doesn't mean that we, it's wrong to be different. It, it's just that our difference should not divide us. Something bigger should unite us in spite of those differences. And then those differences have a chance to actually have flavor and impact upon each of our lives to the glory of God. For instance, in my early days of ministry, it seemed to be a time in society when... Uh, with regard to racial issues, it was becoming more popular for white people to make comments that they don't see color as a positive statement to the other side, the darker skinned people, that they just saw each other as equals they didn't see color. Uh, I even had that come to me uh, from a very good friend who is African American. And uh, she said, uh, speaking of their pastor who, who took my place when I left that district, that was my first district. And she said, yeah, he, he said he doesn't, he doesn't see color. Everybody's just the same. And I said, hmm, that might not be as good as it sounds. I see color, and it's not negative. When I see color, I appreciate the color God gave. What would it be like if you saw no difference of color in the flowers that are in nature? They're all the same to me. How boring. How insignificant. Prejudice is not based upon seeing color. It's what we do with what we see. As a matter of fact, if I don't see color, if I don't see your difference, what I am likely to then do is treat you as if you're like me. A white guy. An American white guy. And if that's not you, I just miss seeing you because I didn't want to see your color or your nationality, lest it somehow confuse me or cause prejudice. And by doing so, I didn't just deal with prejudice, I erased you. So it is not bad, it is actually good to see color, to see culture to see difference, and to celebrate it. God made us that way. Hallelujah. Anybody love a good stew? I would prefer a stew with all of its chunks of potatoes and carrots and whatever other veggies you put in there, and even if you want to put in some chicken or some beef. I would prefer that much over someone who took all those chunks because you know, it's dangerous to have difference. Let's put it in a blender. Boom. Ah, the juice man loves stuff like that, doesn't he? The juice man blenderizes everything. And now it's just a melting pot to drink, and you don't hardly be to tell what's a potato and a carrot or anything else in there because it's all blenderized together. A stew celebrates that a potato tastes like a potato in that stew and a carrot tastes like a carrot. 
and together they make what Stu is. What would we be if we were just one race? Is that what one people means in Scripture? I don't believe so. One people is not one color, one language. That's what got people into trouble, the Tower of Babel. They were there all, it seems, of one culture, of one language, and it didn't do well for them. It's when our diverse languages and cultures and shades of skin and customs and music and food. Think about the things that reflect culture. When all those can be seen as different because they are and celebrated because they are. And I don't have to like them all, and neither do you, to love each other as being relatives and sourced in the same God. Amen? Remember, God's work on this earth is to reconcile people with Himself through Christ on the cross. And in doing so, to reconcile humanity with itself. 1 Corinthians 5.18 reads, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Remember that the first sin was not directly against God. While it was disobedience to God, and certainly we can say in, in a deeper sense it was a sin against God, the way it expressed itself was sin against man. Accusations. It's her fault. It's his fault. It's someone else's fault. The blame game is the game that Satan has used to take our differences and use them against us because somehow they prove that there's something wrong with us because we're different. Where is that defended by God's Word? Ephesians 2, 8 through 22. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you have your Bibles or Bible devices, I'd like to read that one, 8 through 22, and then share a few things in response, and that will conclude this morning's message. This is Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 22. Are you there? This is the New King James Version. Here we go. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are His workmanship. We all are His workmanship, created in Christ for good works. Good works, morality, it's important to God but it shouldn't be used divisively. Its purpose is to bless humanity. And while we were created for good deeds, we, were not, we are not saved by doing them. Neither are we ultimately lost by doing bad deeds because bad deeds are overcome by the good deeds of Christ. And the good deeds are overcome, our good deeds, by the better and really good deeds that are Christ's. It's not our actions that ultimately determine our reuniting with God and Christ and eternal life, but it is the deeds of Christ which God prepared beforehand that we should then follow Him and walk in them because He led the way. Therefore, verse 11, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, so here he's writing to the church of Ephesus, Paul is. He's writing to those who genealogically, biologically, genetically are Gentiles. Now, do you know what Gentiles means? Pardon? Thank you. 
That, that's a, a Jewish way to say non-Jewish. You're not one of us. In the Muslim world, it would be infidel, which simply means not a Muslim. In the Christian world, it would be non-Christian, unchurched Harry and Mary. You're not one of us. Every religion has some term they use to basically mean however you interpret it and or how negatively you feel it might be. It, what it means is you're out of sight or you're not one of us. So he's writing to those who are genealogically, biologically, um, not a Jew by lineage, by blood, by birth, who are called uncircumcised by what is called circumcised. That is to say, the circumcised, or the Jew, calls the uncircumcised, or the non-Jew, separated from God because they're not circumcised, because they're not Jewish. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and being without God in the world. He's talking now to the Ephesus church, Christians who are non-Jewish Christians, believers that Jesus is the Messiah. But, verse 13, but now in Christ, you who were once far off, referring to all non-Jews, have been brought near. How have we, how have I been brought near? By, by the blood of Christ. Because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we who were outside of the bloodline of the Jewish community, biologically, by faith, like Abraham, believed God, and it was accredited to him as righteousness because he believed God through faith, so we, through faith that Christ came to save all, are included in the bloodline of Christ by faith without need for genealogy. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in the flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, that's the Gentile, the non-Jew, and to those who were near, that's the Jew. For through him, Christ, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you no longer are strangers and foreigners, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fit together, grows into a holy temple to the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. <clears throat> I want to share with you five takeaways. That's going to be really quick. I'm going to try to hit these as fast as I can. But five things, if you're taking notes to write down, or you can watch this later on Facebook, um, five blessings, you could call them, that come from focusing on our forgotten family ties. Here we go. Number one, Jesus Christ has broken down the middle wall of separation. That's verse 14. What are those, what does that wall of separation look like? It's when we say, you know, Greek and Gentile, or I'm sorry, Jew and Gentile, Jew and non-Jew, when we use those terms, and actually Jew and Greek, Greek is another way to say Gentile or non-Jew. Uh, we set up a us versus them. When we say circumcised versus uncircumcised, uh, you might say um, those that have the law versus those that don't have the law. All these are referred to in this passage. These are the ways that we create this wall. Well, they're not like us because they don't have the law. 
We Adventists can relate to this. Sometimes we talk about people who aren't Adventists in a way that treats them as those who don't have the law, don't obey the law. We're the law keepers, like the Jews. We have the law of Moses, and those other ones don't. That kind of wall of separation uh, talked about in a way that sets up a us and them mentality creates a division that gives Satan fertile ground to further divide us. That's not to say that we are not to speak of the law that we're called to obey, to help people be appreciate the Sabbath or the other truths that the law has. That's not what he's talking about here. It's not wrong to have the law or to be circumcised or to be uncircumcised or to be Jew or to be non-Jew. The issue is when we make those issues the point of division, instead of making God in Christ the point of unification. I'm not talking about one church. I'm not talking about doing away with all those differences. Not talking about compromising faith. Don't go there. That's not what I'm talking about. Evangelism requires that, first of all, we have a hearing by those who want to evangelize. No matter which group you identify with, if you want to bring others to your understanding into the realm of your culture or your religion or whatever your group that you usually hang with is, there has to be a respect by the other party to listen to you and hear what you want to share with them. And if they perceive that you've already judged them by the color of your skin, by the name of your denomination, by any other thing that you might use, and these are just reference points, we have focused on the thing Satan wants us to focus on so he can further divide us. Rather than <clears throat> excuse me, the thing God wants us to focus on, which is our common humanity, from which we have a starting point of common ground that we can share why we believe as Adventists what we believe, why Baptists believe what they believe, why Jews believe what they believe, why Muslims believe what they believe, and, and at least now we have a, a grounds for communicating so that God, through relationship, can bring truth to the surface and transform people's lives. We don't transform people. God does. And the only way to allow God to transform and not have it be something that we think we're to do is to love and respect everybody and share our faith openly, but also listen and receive other people's beliefs openly, that we, out of a respectful relationship, allow God to convict the heart of each one. For in the end, no one will appear before me, and no one will appear before you. They will appear before Him, together with ourselves. We'll be waiting in the same line. Why not make peace here? instead of be surprised up there. Amen? <clears throat> Number two. <clears throat> Jesus Christ has abolished in His flesh the enmity. Verses 15 and 16. How many know what enmity means? Shout it out. Yeah, anybody. Hatred, you got it. That is exactly right. Hatred, um, it can also be hostility, the attitude that leads uh, to hatred. In other words, what it's, what it's using by the word enmity is any reason that by which we would justify ourselves to be in opposition to someone else. That motif that we use to make us feel okay, justified, to hate some other group of people, that is done away with and destroyed in Christ. There is no more a place for enmity, for hatred, for hostility between us for whatever reason in Christ. The only one that we are to have hostility towards and that God even facilitates a hostility towards, is found back in Genesis 3. You remember that text? Genesis 3. Yeah, exactly, my brother. Satan in the Garden of Eden. 
Jesus said that the son would create enmity between him and the woman and her seed and his seed. What we should hate is sin and the one who promulgates or, or spreads sin in the world. And instead, the one who pushes sin, Satan, hides behind our differences so that we don't see him, the real enemy, and we accuse instead each other as if we are the evil parties when the evil one stays hidden. Jesus says, in me, there must not be any more enmity between a brother or sister, between a human being, so that the one who is the real enemy might be caught out in the open and be revealed. Him we should hate so that we might love each other. Number three, Jesus Christ created in himself one new man from the two. <clears throat> what are the two men? The Jew and the non-Jew. In Jesus, read the book of Acts. The Jew was never told, you must stop being a Jew and become like Gentile Christians, like the Christian church we know today. Neither was the new Christian church rising up from Gentiles who didn't have the heritage of the Jewish people. Neither were they told that they had to adopt all the laws of Moses. In Christ, both were made acceptable to God and both were allowed to practice different forms of religion that weren't different religions because they were the same God that was being worshipped. Jesus Christ created in himself a new man from the two, thus making peace. That's verse 15 and 17. Primitive godliness that I keep having come back to me week after week. The Lord keeps impressing me. Primitive godliness, Pastor Mark. Primitive godliness, Mark. You need to press on and learn what that means and, and put it into your life. And as I think about that in this context, it is a seeking to focus on our common need of God. Is there anybody here that doesn't need God? Is there anybody here that didn't come into existence from God, that came into existence by some other means? I suppose, I know there are people in the world that don't believe that God created. But I think probably here, I'm sure the majority, if not perhaps everyone here today, believes that we were created. So we have the same Father instead of there being two or three or multiple religions by which we can claim to have Christ. This is not in my notes, but maybe to try to help make this more understandable and challenge me afterwards if you hear it differently than I'm intending to say it. It is not Judaism that leads us to salvation any more than it is Christianity who leads us to salvation or Islam, or any other religion. Those are all the results of humanity's attempt to formalize what God has done on the earth. They're not the real deal. They are forms focusing us on the real deal, but the real deal is God Himself. And when we let our religion separate us from God Himself and each other, we have lost sight of the purpose of our religion or our faith, which is to lead us to God Himself and give us connections of commonality, since we're all from that same God, to each other that we might begin to communicate and share so that God can transform. Number four. There's only five. We're almost done. The blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for all sinners and accepted by faith is our reconciliation to God and thus to each other. Verse 16. The real enemy we are to hate is Satan. That was Genesis 3, verse 15. When I have done marital counseling before, I have oftentimes described the 
relationship in marriage to be like a triangle in which God is the head and the husband is on one side and the wife is on the other. And sometimes there are things that draw us together. Maybe how we look or smell or our abilities or whatever that attracts us. There are those sensual kinds of things that bring us together. But there's also a lot of things that cause us to have conflict. We don't see eye to eye. We don't keep the same house order. We don't do things the same way. So how are two very different people going to be consistently growing closer together? It's not by trying to get their fleshly uh, uh, selves to cooperate apart from their pursuit of God. If they focus on growing closer to God, there is no way that they can both get closer to God, who's at the head of a triangle, without doing what? Getting closer to each other. Amen? At the point where you and I meet God, I will meet you. And you will meet me. Or one of us isn't there with God. That's the point. Uh, a number of years ago, <clears throat> I think it was, uh, man, I forgot his name now. He was a, a, a speaker. Um, when I was just becoming a Christian, I read a number of his books. He wrote about love. He's now deceased. But he wrote about a trip that he took to around the world. And I think it was in India where he ran across some people. He was listening to their faith and they they gave him a, an idea of a, a, a term in India that I've asked Indians since what it means. And they just say it means hi. <laughs> it means hello. He had given it another spin. It's the word namaste. If I'm pronouncing it right. I hope I am. I am. And uh, he said he learned from some people that he met that namaste meant this. When I say namaste to you, it means I honor the place in you where when you are in that place in you and I am in that place in me, we are in the same place together. Now, maybe that, I don't know. But for me, that says volumes about God's ideal. When we are one with God, we will not be enemies of our brother and sister of another human being, we will actually have a Christ-like attitude of love for them. They might reject us, but we will reject no one any more than Jesus did. And number five, the last one. Both Jew and non-Jew, <clears throat> the two who have become one in Christ, are called to have access to the triune God. Do you remember reading it in verse 18? Through Him, referring to Jesus, the Son of God, we both, Jews and non-Jews, have access by one Spirit, that's God the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to the Father, that's God the Father. It is the triune relationship that sets an example for us. If God can be one, and yet be Father and Son and Holy Spirit. He's not asking us to do anything that He is not already demonstrating to us for us to be one people. Not one people in any human form, but one people under Him. One people under God. That's not a nationalistic appeal. It's not a church religion appeal. It is a higher appeal than any religion and any culture any uh, nationality can provide because it requires us to look beyond our distinct differences of nationality, of religion, of culture, to our commonality in one who is so different from us, we can only see glimpses of him in each other, and yet no one represents his fullness. In verse 19, we are called to fellow citizenship. We are members of the household of God because of our unity in Jesus Christ. 
It's not meant to solve our differences. It's not meant to confuse our distinctions, but that we might have respect and love for one another in spite of those differences. And let God be God. Let God be judge. I don't know your eternal destiny, and you don't know mine. And I'm not going to try to pretend that I can know it. I'm only going to speak of the relationship I have and the understanding I have, and I will listen to your understanding and the relationship you have. And somewhere in that interchange, I believe, because Scripture shows it from Genesis all the way to Revelation, that when we do that, God shows up and He changes lives. Think and pray about this. With all the religious, ethnic, and political divisions that Satan has been involved in, hiding himself behind our differences, being the instigator of divisiveness, how, this is the closing comment, how might focusing on our forgotten family ties in common, in a common creator and a common redeemer, how might that be an empowering exercise for you and me? Not only for this week, but for the months and years to come. Let's pray. Father God, may you be glorified this morning. May we recognize how much we don't know. How other than you, we really are. So that we are less likely to judge others who equally are different from you. Yet we were all designed and created to be in your image. To grow up to be like you. And you've continued to strive with humanity to help us to become more like you generation after generation. And yet it has not been a linear journey. We have had periods of success and periods of failure, just like the Israelites. So have we in America and so have other cultures. But Father God, help us to shift our focus. We're using Zoom this morning and the language of Zoom to spotlight something other than ourselves, something other than each other something other than our differences, help us to spotlight and to focus on you. Our common source in you. Our common destination to be with you throughout all eternity. Our common need to recognize that we're not you and that we're fallen. Our commonality to recognize that also in you we are saved and we are beautiful. And we already have been redeemed by faith in Jesus. All these opposing comments are true in the gospel of Jesus. As can be found our oneness through the creative power of God and the inner working of His Holy Spirit. And the self-sacrificing acts of love as demonstrated in the life and the cross of Christ. Father God, today, may we draw lines of commonality in new ways. May we find ways to open our arms a little wider and to include in ever more and to see exclusion not as a friend, but as a foe to what God is doing on the earth and would invite us to participate in. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each one of you. Thank you for being here today and continue to pray for our church as we move forward. We, uh, we are living in challenging times, but I hope it will be said of us by future generations that we lived in these times well for God that we demonstrated faith, that we lived out of love, and that we made a difference. May God bless you to that end, and may he bless me to that end, and keep you safe till next week.
We'll see you then. God bless you. Thank you.